welcome to the first episode of Politics Today in this year, 2016. And I just want to remind you that here on Politics Today, we don't look to hammer at people, peoples, or nations. We are just here reporting the politics as it is happening from across the world, across Africa, and across Nigeria. Now, as this is Politics Today, we always say one thing. When the righteous lead, the people rejoice. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Politics Today. And today, my guest in the studio with me here is Mr. Emmanuel Akura Ada. Once again here with me on Politics Today. Mr. Akura Ada, welcome to the new year and the new episode in the new year of Politics Happy New Year to you, Mustafa, and thank you for having me. No, anytime, you are welcome. And uh, we're going to go straight into it. We have a lot to talk about today, as we always do. Now, first thing I want to discuss with you is Nigerian politics, as we always do. And the first thing is Boko Haram and Buhari in Nigeria. Yeah. First thing I want to ask you is, did the president get it right when he came and said his first mandate is to wipe out Boko Haram by the 30, 31st of December 2015? Did he get it right? Yeah, uh, there are so many things I want people to understand because everyone is getting everything twisted. They, they think when the, the president said he wants to wipe Boko Haram out, what he was saying is to make sure there's no Boko Haram activity in Nigeria. No. What the president said is this, and he came out and made it public for everyone to understand, made it clear for everyone to understand. It's Boko Haram before the previous government, you see that Boko Haram is going out, coming out to attack homes, kill innocent people. That is not happening in Nigeria anymore. What they do these days is they're using improvised devices these days to attack, which is the suicide bombing that is taking place in Nigeria right now. That is the only way Boko Haram can operate in Nigeria at the moment. They can't come outside to attack a police station, a, a, a barrack, or attack individuals the way they used to do anymore. It's not so. So the president, by saying this, he has succeeded in making sure Boko Haram has been pushed to a place whereby they can't come out in public to attack uh, uh, public civilians. Okay, now, quickly, let me just say that the, we saw the president uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi speaking to Ban Ki-moon, the, yeah, the UN president. Secretary. Now, the thing is, when he's speaking to these people, they, the first thing they'll ask him is, how's it going with Boko Haram? It's a national threat. It's an international threat. Yeah. It's a continental threat. Yeah. How much is it being downed? Let me, put, let me use that word, downed yeah. in the country. Yeah. Now, for you, looking at where the president is coming from, I know you are an advocate of Buhari and his government. <laughs> what, I would say so. All right, if you say so. If you say so. I am not advocate of Buhari, but what I'm trying to do is, uh, we all in Nigeria, we think uh, this is time for change that we've all been yearning for. Because uh, the previous uh, government, where we see a government for 16 years of poverty, 16 years of innocent souls that we've lost for the past uh, few years. You see what Boko Haram is doing in the, uh, in the north, northern part of Nigeria. And you look at it, uh, okay, when is that change going to come? So when Buhari step out, we feel we want to have something different. Let's have a new government entirely that is different from the, uh, the PDP government. So now we have Buhari in government. Every one of us is happy. We want to see him bring that change. And I'm talking about Boko Haram. Boko Haram, you see, uh, I was discussing it with my producer, and I said to him, you know, these Boko Haram, before, like I said to you earlier, before, you see Boko Haram coming out to challenge the army, challenge the entire government, making an attempt to attack the FCT, where the president was. That was what happened but then, in the But then if you the president government. speaking to Ban Ki-moon now yeah. in an international conference, and he's asking you, what's going on? Is it downed? What do you say to him? What I would say to him is, I will explain just what I explained to you. And Buhari has been doing that. He has been explaining to them that, you know, right now, it's difficult. And even the American government came out to say that deal, trying to stop suicide bombing is one difficult task. It's something that you cannot do overnight. And if you look at a country like Nigeria, where we don't have uh, these uh, ammunitions to fight, where the armies are complaining that, look, we don't have arms to fight Boko Haram. And for them to be able to push them to that stage where uh, they are coming out, it's now under threat. They don't feel safe coming out anymore to attack anybody or attack Nigerian government. All they do these days is just use the innocent children that they, they're using now. You see, so to me, I would say the president has really tried. Okay. 
All right then, um, the word from Mr. Akura Ada is that the president has done a stellar job so far, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, all right then, now we're going to move on to our next topic, which has to do with 1.35 trillion, not million, not billion, but trillion, with a T that has the federal government has said has been stolen by 55 government officials and businessmen. Now, we saw um, Lai Mohammed come out and say that this is the amount from 55 individuals. Yeah. What body, what governmental, non-governmental, or you know, independent body mm -hmm. came out to give him the figures that he's pushing out? You, you look at it like he's in government, right? You have, uh, you have all the departments, the ministries in government that they got these figures from. You see only in the, in the Nigerian I mean, you see where they have 18 generals embezzled a lot of money you see in the oil sector you see in the in the education sector you see different uh, ministries in the government that came out with these figures and you can't argue with them because you understand how nigeria has been living for the past uh, is it, should i say 60 or 50 years you see the government each and every government that comes in the most important thing the first thing they do is to try and enrich their pockets mm. themselves to enrich themselves they don't think about the, the Nigerians I who mean, put them there. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of, it's a lot of, it's a, a whole lot of money. And I believe what he said, because if you see one individual, because I remember under the previous government where they declared $20 million missing in one account. Where is that happening in the world? <laughs> Only in Nigeria can find that. So I, 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 mean, I, I totally okay, agree let, with let's quickly Let's quickly look at the president himself, because this yeah. is a battle that he's taken to the maximum. Yeah. He's said this is the first thing I want to eradicate, corruption. Corruption in the government, corruption in all sectors. Is he fighting a selective battle though? Because most of the people coming out now are your uh, opposition party people. Yeah. I mean, we saw that the PDP spokesperson uh, was uh, Mentu, uh, Olisa Mentu. Olisa Mentu. Yeah. That, is, that is the problem. That is what I've been trying to explain to people. And I explain this a lot of times. I say to somebody that, I was, saying, I was talking to a colleague actually, I say to him that if you feel as Mustafa you're sitting here, if you want to accuse me of crime, right, make sure you're clean. Mm. Then you can accuse me, I will take it from you. If the PDP say, this is a selected battle, then why are you corrupt? Why do you embezzle Nigerian money? If you, if, you, if you are clean, the government has no right to investigate or probe you. Right? But if you are not clean, then you have something to be uh, afraid of, which is what the president is doing. Right? The president came out and said, if you find anybody in my cabinet who is corrupt or who has been who has been arrested or has been detained by the police because of corruption, bring forward those allegations. And I will make sure I deal with that person. Nobody has ever been able to come out and say, this, this for a, a past governor or this minister of yours was arrested because he stole billions, he stole millions of naira. Mm -hmm. So he's making sure that in his camp, everyone is clean. But you look at the previous government, for instance, the, uh, 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 the former national security advisor was arrested. He was busy singing, calling names of people. So who could argue with the president that he's not doing his job? This is Nigerian money. Where you see one person embezzling billions of one person will embezzle billions of dollars, billions of naira. Why the, the Nigerians are living in poverty? Nigerians don't have basic amenities. The Nigerians who put you in that place are not living very well. But you, you have your kids are being trained in UK, in Harvard, in Oxford. Then these people back home don't have anything to live on. Well, um, well, let me just ask uh, one more question before we move on. Yeah. Now, we see the anti-corruption crusade of our president. I mean, and as you've said, you've outlined it that, look, he's taking the right steps. Yeah. Can he totally eradicate the snake of corruption in Nigeria? There's no way in the world that there's no corruption. But the most important thing is the level of the corruption is one thing that he's trying to cut I short. Mean, we saw a lawmaker in the north calling for people to be amputated, amputated which, I, which I support that 20% because if yeah, you can do that, no, listen, if you can do it, this is a Christian uh, TV. We are Christians. We believe in forgiveness. Mm. If anyone sin against you, forgive them. But let me tell you something, Mustafa, in the course of this uh, corruption in Nigeria, a lot of innocent souls have died. In a lot of people who were depending, help these people with. We have Boko Haram in Nigeria today because of how poor these people are from that part of the country. So if you are poverty, you don't have, you are a poor man, you don't have a job, 
You don't have anywhere to go to, and somebody comes to you and say, I'm going to give your family $10,000. This is what I want you to do. Trust me, you will do it. Because you, do, you don't go to school, you don't understand anything. You know, that is a level of poverty. That is what these people have done to that country. So if anybody comes out and say, I want these people to be killed, I want these people to be jailed. I want this happens to these people. Trust me, I will support that decision. I will stand by that decision 100%. Okay, then. Uh, we heard uh, the thoughts of Mr. Akura Ada on that one. Okay, I don't know if I support him on the amputation thing, but <laughs> we'll see how it goes. We're not sure it's going to take place anyway, but no. we're just saying. Again. You're just saying. We're just saying. Well, yeah. uh, as I said earlier, I gave you a good enough warning. All right, then. Now, let's move on uh, to... The staple of Nigeria, we know that the oil prices have been crashing. Uh, we've given several reasons why that's happening. But um, right now, what's happening in Nigeria is even the oil itself that's coming out is under threat because we've heard of a spate of bombings in the Niger Delta region, yeah. which is the major oil producing region yeah. of Nigeria. First question I want to ask Mr. Akurada is, Mr. Akurada, why now? It's, oh, but should I use, is it, is it uh, political motivated? Because this is um, a, a, a situation where PDP is out of government, then you have APC being in charge. When PD, PDP were there, you don't, uh, you don't have to, you got to uh, uh, experience uh, incidents like this. But now that PDP is out, and knowing very well that the uh, president who the APC took over from is from that region. Mm. See, uh, a lot of people, a lot of things can happen. They can do everything. And another thing I want to explain to you is that most of our look, let's not look at it. Okay, these are criminals mm. who are trying to uh, destabilize the country. No, these are people where in the region where you're getting the mineral resources from. The, what the government is supposed to do is to make sure that, look, if you are educated, you don't look at your fellow man because you know your worth. Mm. You know what you can do, right? If these people are being educated, if these people are being well taken care of, if these basic amenities are being provided for these people in this region, trust me, nobody will look at, let's go destroy this because it's the only means of them getting money. Uh, money. And at the same time, the government is making everyone in Nigeria believe that without oil, there is no Nigeria which is also a very bad thing. Nigeria is a country we're blessed with a lot of mineral resources. We can decide, okay, today we want to farm and make money from that farming. We get billions of naira every day. If we decide, okay, the cement that we want to go into, there are so many things, if it is only fishing in Nigeria, there are so many things in Nigeria today that it, this government can be able to use to uh, 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 make sure that every Nigeria is living okay and these things will not be coming out. So you won't blame these people that much. You will look at it, okay, they're fighting for what they, want. what they believe is. Now, I want to quickly give a little bit of a timeline as to these bombings before I ask you further questions. First of all, um, on Friday night, we saw the Marakamba through Otunana, I, uh, apologies if I don't get it right, uh, and Abiteye to Escarvos, while Olero to Escarvos gas lines, all these were attacked early hours of uh, Friday. Thursday, Escarvos, Wari, Abuja, Lagos pipelines were under attack. Um, the people in the region, the Tserkiri people, raised the alarm and they thought, because they thought they could, these attacks could you know, change into uh, a state of uh, cultural violence that we saw between the Ijo and the Tserkiri people. I mean, this sabotage, we've been seeing it, I mean, before. Yeah. Why is it now, when Tompolo was declared wanted by the courts in Nigeria for an alleged 34 billion naira fraud, why is it only now that these things are happening? Is it not? One of those, is it one of those coincidences or is it not one of those where he's actually trying to push his own agenda? Mustafa, anything you and I can discuss right now will only be speculating. But there's something I wanted to understand. There are uh, so many things to look into this. There are so many uh, factors for one to consider. One is that this guy came out to say he has nothing to do with the attack, right? He has nothing to do with the attack. And another thing I wanted to understand is Someone somewhere might have these to do, might have these idea, might have these, uh, uh, these plans to attack these, but they don't know how to go about it, waiting for the sitting government to make a mistake, which the mistake being that the court declared, uh, declared this guy uh, uh, wanted, which that will also uh, give them that room for them to be able to attack, so they will put it on him, 
that he is the one who, uh, uh, who, who is behind his boys attacking these uh, pipelines. But there are so many things, like I said, so many things that we can only speculate right now. We don't know which one is true and which one is not. But the president came out to say that he is investigating and is going to make sure that he bring everyone to book. They brought these people to book, those who are behind the attack. You know, the final question I want to ask you on this uh, topic is, is this the start of a Niger Delta militancy that we saw about good 12 years back? Is this is uh, no, it's not in the sense that, you see, there is a... Um, there is what the, these guys, uh, these guys are looking for something. And what they're looking for is they want the president to come to table with them, sit and discuss with them. Because uh, remember what Yeradua did when he first became the president. He has to uh, start a program which was taking most of these guys out, training them like coming here in South Africa, taking them to America. He was uh, in a way trying to compensate them. Let them understand that, guys, you know what, we're going to work together, which is what uh, this government has not started doing yet. So they, they want this government to come sit with them on the table and say, okay, let's talk. Wow. How do you want this done? We don't want you guys to attack. You don't want you guys to do, uh, start anything, you know. How are we going to do it? So they'll be able to tell you their terms and tell you how we are going to work mm -hmm. together, you know. So okay. I believe it's also one part of what is happening there. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Akurada. You're still going to be with us. Uh, we're going to go on a quick break here on Politics Today. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to uh, Politics Today today. And we still have Mr. Akura Ada in studio with us talking all things politics. And now we're moving away from Nigeria to the continent at large. I'm talking about Africa. First topic that we have on is uh, Yoweri Museveni from Uganda. Yeah. And uh, let me give you a quick, uh, quick historical note on this man. He's been the president for 30 years. But when he first came in, he wanted to put a stop to sitting presidents, presidents that will be there for decades. And he's become one of those presidents. Now he's putting his, his name into the ballot box another time. First thing I want to ask is looking at he himself, the president of Uganda, yeah. how are we sure that he is the right man to keep pushing the country forward? You, you see, uh, Mustafa, there are so many things that you need to understand. Most of these guys who are in charge, who are in power for so long and they don't want to step aside. They like so Museveni, Gaddafi, Mugabe, and all those guys. These were the guys that actually fought for the freedom of their people. Now, in the course of that, they discover that they want to govern their people without any international intervention. And they feel, if I leave today, they, my people are still going to go back to those years where we we'll get orders from America, we we'll get orders from uh, UK, we we'll get orders from yes, Russia, yes sir, stuff. Which, um, our people are not comfortable with it. A lot of people, which they made everyone to believe that the African leaders are, are power hungry people. When they're in power, they don't want to step aside. But they actually meant well for their people. I'm not saying uh, your people are suffering is a good thing, it's not a good thing, but you also need to look at why they are in power and why they feel they are the best candidate for their people. They are the best people to rule their people. One of the re that's one of the reasons. They feel uh, uh, like the case of uh, uh, Mugabe in, uh, in Zimbabwe where the, the America brought in Shanghai to make sure that they divide the government, they take over the government of Zimbabwe. That is still going back to those days where uh, Shagara is going to be answering to America. Mm -hmm. It's going to be telling America is going to be telling them what to do and what not to do. So yeah, Museveni feel, Faso. yeah, in Burkina Faso you saw the case. So Museveni feel, if I go today, my people are still going to go in the hands of these people. But before that, I want to put everything in position then, and make sure that. Before, before we go too far, I mean, we have a Kiza Besigi. Uh, yeah. Apologies once again if I'm not pronouncing it right. Yeah, Kiza, uh, um, and Amama Mbabazi. These are the people that are challenging him now. And they have promised that within the first 100 years of their rule, if they're put in power, they're going to change the constitution, bring it back to a system where after a certain amount of terms in power, you have to hand over. Now, to, to the are these people genuine? Or are they, as you say, puppets of the international community? As you are talking, do you believe what those people say? Well, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's it's the African promise. 
So I would just say it's African promise because we've seen a lot of leaders come out and say, if I become the leader tomorrow, this is what I'm going to do for my people. This is what I'm not going to do for my people. At the end, the opposite is a, is a, is a case. We don't have African leaders who, until we see that happening, uh, otherwise I'm not going to believe whatever it is that they're saying because I believe most of any say the same thing. Yeah, that if did. I take over, I'm sure uh, I will just be there for a certain, uh, a certain years then give it to uh, somebody else to come and be the, the okay. president. Finally on this question and uh, the topic of uh, Uganda, has Museveni himself actually performed as the leader of Uganda? He hasn't. He has failed his people. And that is because, like I told you before, that is because he, he don't want to cooperate with the, the uh, should I use the guy at the top, the people who want him to answer, say sad to them. So it's, it's a bit difficult. Economy-wise, they're suffering as a country. Uh, Uganda economy has not been stable for so long since, you know, when uh, this guy was there, yeah. uh, Idi Amin, yeah. and all that. And so he coming in and not being a friend of the world powers and all that, so it's, it's just difficult. He has not performed, wow. but I wouldn't blame him that much because I know what he is going through as a leader. As a leader. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You sound like a president yourself. <laughs> uh, all right then. Now we're going to now move from there to a spate of attacks that happened in Burkina Faso. We saw 29 people killed in a, an attack linked to Al Qaeda. Now, first thing I want to ask you, Mr. Akur Ada, yeah. is we've seen Al-Qaeda in the news. As Africans, over the past, I mean, we started with Osama bin Laden, and from there we saw it, and then suddenly it trickled down into Africa. Why is that? It, that is, um, there is, if, if we were to talk about this um, topic right now, most of us, I'm sure we're not going to be able to finish, but I will just have to give you one or two things. This is Africa, one of the richest continents on Earth, right? We have everything then this is a continent where is the poorest continent on earth, where you see uh, few people go to school, there are no jobs, there's nothing to do. What do you expect? The Al-Qaeda now is being formed by the rich guys in, in the world, even the Americans among. The UK, Russians, you have them everywhere. These are guys who have a lot of money. Now they come to Africa, they feel, where are we gonna get people? who are going to work for us, actually. 1.5 billion people. But who are we going to get? We can go to this continent where it's very easy to deceive. It's very easy to convince people to join. Why? Because most of these people are just rooming down the street because of corruption in their countries, because of bad leadership, because of no jobs, because of no lack of education. You know, they need to feed their, they families. To feed their families, they need to take care of themselves. So it's easy to, for them to go there, convince these kids, even though they are turning the Quran upside down. Making people believe that in Quran, if you kill for God, you go to heaven, which is not so. Mm -hmm. They tell me, if you, as educated as you are, somebody comes to you with that, most of us go and kill 200 people, you have your reward in heaven. Are you going to do that? You're not going to be able to do that because you understand, you know. If you're talking about the Quran, talking about the Bible, I know what the Bible says, mm -hmm. right? My Bible says I should forgive, even if we do something good. Mm -hmm. We're not saints, but... The Bible says I should forgive. I understand those parts. So if you are reading only one side of the Bible for me, I should be able to ask you, why are you not reading this side of the Bible? You understand what I'm saying? So it's very easy for them, to, for them to come to Africa, go to Nigeria, go to Kenya, go to Somalia, go to Ethiopia. Why are they not going to uh, other, other parts of uh, Africa where they feel the people are doing okay? Because they feel if you go there, these people are not going to listen to you. But if you go to the poorest African countries, you will get people who you can be able to convince easily to join. Okay, now let's now look specifically at Bo um, Burkina Faso. Yeah. Sorry, and um, <clears throat> now the, the attack took place at the Splendid Hotel there in Ouagadougou, yeah. and it was targeting Western diplomats. Now, is Al-Qaeda now trying to say that, or its affiliate, let me put yeah. more specifically, are they trying to say that it's too hard for us to attack them in their own countries, we must wait for them to come down to Africa and then try and get them there. It's the same thing that we're talking about. They brainwashed these guys. They made them believe that their problem is America. Their problem is people from the uh, UK. Their problem is Russians. Their problem is these people. That is what they made them believe. And now they are, imagine uh, they're telling you that 
uh, if Americans are here, things are not going to be okay with us. They're going to steal from you. They're, They're going to steal from you, do these things from you. So now where is a better way for them to do that than on the African continent where they feel Americans are coming to trade, they're coming to do businesses. Mm -hmm. Now they have their people here to attack these people. Let's do this to these people. Because, you know, if you kill one American, Americans will come for you. Yeah. They will feel the pain. Yeah. They will feel, okay, something happened. But if we kill 200,000 Nigerians, Americans can just come outside and condemn us. That is very, that is barbaric. Mm -hmm. But if we kill one America, they will do everything to make sure that they get you. They get you. Okay then, uh, finally on this topic, do you see any way that it, this scourge can be halted, can be counted, I mean totally deadened? In Africa, I would only speak about African continent. It's for the leaders, the government to do something. If we're talking about, look, I was saying to, um, I was saying to a friend like, you know, we grew up in Nigeria, right? we know how the situation in Nigeria is. We have everything in Nigeria. We even have water where other Africans don't have. But how many people can you go to their homes and see water flowing in their homes? True. That is for the government to make sure you put these basic amenities, provide this to the people out there and see, they're not going to complain. Even if you embezzle money, if the corruption is much, nobody's going to complain. But when, whereby the people are not living okay, how do you expect them not to think evil of the government? They will always have something because negative. It's their, it's their fault. They will always have something negative to do or to say. So the only way for them to stop these, uh, uh, these uh, Boko Haram, Al Qaeda, all these taking place in Africa, is for them to make sure they put their houses in order. Hmm, true that. And uh, in order for them to put their houses together, I mean, they just need to get the right type of leadership, as we always say here on Politics Today. Well, we're going to go on another break and we'll be coming back with your world news, talking all things Donald Trump. The big man is about to get kicked out of the UK permanently. Let's see on the other side. We're going on a break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Politics Today, uh, where we always remind you that when the righteous lead, the people rejoice. Now, Mr. Akurada is still with me here in the studio, and we're going to be talking world politics, like I said before the break. First things first, we need to talk about Donald Trump. I mean, this man is coming <laughs> off the wrong end of controversy. Yeah. I mean, there's good controversy, there's bad controversy, and then there's Donald Trump's controversy. Yeah. I mean, now the British um, ministers of parliament are looking at banning him from coming into the UK because there was an opinion poll where 574,000 people signed and said, no, we don't want him. What do you think? Uh, um, why are they finding it difficult to ban him? If you don't want somebody to come, you can just sit and say, okay, no, we don't want Mustafa to come to South Africa or to Nigeria. It's as simple as that. They don't have to go to the house to debate on that. Why are they saying, we don't want this guy to come? We want to see, hear what the people are going to say. Yeah. If they, it's very easy for them to say, Africans, if you're coming from Nigeria, coming from South Africa, coming from everywhere in the Middle East, they shouldn't give you a visa to come. Or oh, these are requirements. They don't debate about it. They just say, okay, no, this is sealed. You're not coming. But why is it that they have to? And Donald Trump never said he's going to UK. That's another thing. Even the, his personal advisor came out to say, this guy never said to anyone that he's going to UK. So why they call? They're saying that. They're why they call? Why they call for him not coming to UK in the first place? This guy, he's he spoke the minds of most Americans. Some of them have these ideas, but they can't come aside to say it. Some don't have the ways to say it. Some have, but for the fact that okay, everyone is going to look at me like I am the bad person here. They're not saying it. So, uh, but I think they're not going to ban Donald Trump not coming into UK. They're not going to ban him. Okay. I, now, that um, I, sorry, uh, the Labour Party MP Paul Flynn mm -hmm. was the one res presiding on the debate mm -hmm. and he said that these petitioners were outraged about what Donald Trump has been saying and his political mandate. Mm -hmm. Now for you, is that going to hamper his bid to become America's next president? It's going to. It's going to in a way because I told you before that America itself, you see, the only thing that America used to win election in every election, presidential election, is their policies in the Middle East, which I told you this before. And Donald Trump coming out to say this, a lot of Americans are going to look, or American uh, 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 people are going to look, okay, if this guy becomes 
or uh, this guy becomes a president, so many things are not going to go right in the Middle East. He might decide, okay, you know what? We don't want to deal with Middle, Middle East anymore. We're just going to leave them there, let them take care of their own affairs, and it's going to affect America because America has a lot of interest in that, uh, that part of that, that continent. So it's going to affect him big time. He's, I, don't, I don't even, me, I look at him these days as a joke. He's not going to win. He's just a joker. He's not going to win. Anymore. All right, then. On that point, we're going to now move on to the Taiwan elections that were just concluded. And Taiwan came out and elected its first ever female president in the person of Tsai Ing-wen. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's an interesting name. Yeah. Like, full congratulations to her win, becoming the first female president of Taiwan. Now, first question. I need to ask you is how will her election being a United States and United Kingdom trained scientist affect Taiwan's position with China? It's not going to affect their position. It's only rather going to make their position strong. But then, but then wait, let me, let me first come out and say that she says she wants to revitalize the economy yeah. because she says Taiwan trading with China mm. has been negative for Taiwan. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like this, Mustafa, when the former president or the president who was the previous president, Ma, Ma was there, he said to his people that he is going to make sure his relationship with China, as cementing that relationship, is going to bring a lot of changes in Taiwan, which that never happened. So a lot of people then felt laid down by the, the president. So now they feel, okay, with this woman coming in, this woman then promised them a different uh, package, saying to them that if... I become the president. My position with America, with China, we change for the better. We change so I will be able to improve the situation of the people from Taiwan. So uh, she said that, but that was just a political promise, which it's yet to be seen. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, now finally on this topic, I want to ask, now with a female president yeah. and gender equality around the world being very, very key topic, yeah. how would gender equality in Taiwan change? Well, I, I'm not going to tell you uh, this is what is going to change, but I want to tell you that the, the situation there is very bad. It's very, very bad. Throughout her campaign, I've been following her, throughout her campaign, she never came out to speak, say anything about uh, uh, women's rights, human, uh, human rights, uh, whatever, in, uh, but in Taiwan. Surely it has to be uh, that, is the, that, that should be, but she never said anything about it, which is a very surprising thing to me. Because I feel, as a female who is coming there for the first time, you should be able to tell people, look, if I become... Because if you check the working conditions of uh, the people in Taiwan, they're very... A lady is... If you're sick working as a woman, you are given only one day off. Only one day off. If you have a baby, you are given only 30 minutes for a break to go and breastfeed that child, you are working. Even if you give birth today, you're resuming work tomorrow. You see the conditions were just very, that very bad. And for a very long time, people will be crying that, okay, these uh, conditions need to be changed. Somebody need to do something to this. Human rights groups, organizations, they've been campaigning, they've been fighting just to make the situation better for the women who are living there. But she never said anything about it. So all I can say is, it might improve, it might not improve, but we just have to wait and see what she will do at the end of the day. Well, that's one wait that we're very eager yeah. to see. Now, we're going to talk finally today on politics today about what happened in Pakistan on Wednesday morning. I mean, we saw armed gunmen raid a university in Pakistan and kill 23 people, injuring over 300 others. Now, this is not the first time we're seeing it happen in the Peshawar region. This is not. I mean, the last time it was 140 kids people, children that were killed. That were killed. Now, what is going on in Pakistan? I mean, does the government not have a proper scheme to protect its own people? What is going on, Mustafa, in Iraq? What is going on in Syria? What is going on in Yemen? What is going on in Nigeria? What is going on in Cameroon? What is going on in Burkina Faso? Libya. These Libya. These are the questions that you need to ask yourself. Why is it that these countries that have a lot of mineral resources that are going through this. Why are you not asking yourself this? Why are we not having terrorist attack in Southern Amer South America where you have, people don't have anything? Why are we not having these attacks? These are things you need to understand. And this is not happening by, look, people say, we say a lot of things, we say, because Pakistan is a Muslim country. 
Why is a Muslim attacking and killing themselves? There are Muslims there, but the way do we reason are different. There are Muslims there where the poverty level from these countries is just so high that external forces can come in and tell you easily this is what we want you to do. The government is not giving you what they should be giving you. You can easily be deceived. You go ahead and attack your own government. The same thing happened, is happening in Syria. The same thing is happening in Yemen. Imagine the Syrian people, uh, the, 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 the president has been with them for a long time. They never complained. Until external forces started uh, uh, clamoring for change, saying we want this president out because the people are suffering. Who told you the people are suffering? Then they started killing themselves. The same situation in Pakistan. The same situation in Iraq. Why do we have to be the ones from outside to go tell people to change their leaders? Why are they not being the ones to say, we don't want these people anymore. These we are going to the port to so take this person out. It's, they're making everyone believe it's the leadership. But it's not the leadership. These are people who don't want to allow other people to rule their countries in peace. If you allow the, other, uh, the country, the people, the people to rule and govern themselves, they are people. You are not going to have situations like this. You are not going to have it. Because if we've been in Nigeria for so many years, with poverty level, with corruption. We never had a cause to have terrorist attack everywhere, anywhere in Nigeria, until somebody made us believe that, okay, you know what? The leaders are not doing enough to take care of your people. All these years we're living fine. You know, so it's, it has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with, you're a Muslim, I'm a Muslim, we don't have, we're supposed to attack each other. Now people are making it believe that a Muslim is a terrorist, it's a lie. That is, not, that is not the issue. The issue is that people are busy brainwashing these kids, making them take arms against the government. Where are they getting these arms from? They, you see a kid who don't go to school, who don't have money, but have guns that are more expensive than the ones the government is using to fight them. Where are they getting it from? Tough talk. It is, it is it's very, it's very sad situation, my brother, what is happening around the world. Wow. Well, <clears throat> on that note, uh, we've come to the end of another episode of Politics Today. We would just like to send out our deepest sympathies to the people of uh, Pakistan and the people of Burkina Faso. Uh, we share in your grief and we hope for a speedy recovery to all those that have been affected by the spate of violence in the country. Well, from all of us here in um, politics today, and I'm sure also from Mr. Akura Ada, we would just like to say thank you for watching, and don't forget to tune in next week. We're here on Politics Today. We always say, when the righteous lead, the people rejoice. Yes.